Good morning, BG4 and friends who might be watching from just about anywhere. First of all, I just want to greet all of you who are worshiping from home this morning and just affirm that that is a great choice for a lot of people this week. Um, we have been wrestling with how to best be the church in this unusual time when Governor Inslee has given us new criteria and new um, ways to think about helping our community get through the COVID-19 crisis. We, d we were given the option to continue to meet in person at 25% capacity, which is what we've been doing all along, and of course taking the recommended safety precautions. I just wanted to say that we try to balance valuing the health of body, soul, and spirit at our church. And we are finding that parents really need a place for their youth to connect in this season because their mental health um, needs to be addressed as well. Um, so for some people, gathering is also a really important step for their health if it can be done safely. And for others, the best option is to gather online. And we just want to tell you that we love you, we see you, we welcome your contact with prayer requests, and we consider this online service to be a real service and part of BG4. And we're so glad you're here today. This morning, I want to talk about something else that I wish all my friends, those that haven't darkened the door of church in years, those that really don't know Jesus personally, I want them to know that Jesus sees people. Recently, I took a walk with one of my best friends at Louisville. And when your family's been going through a health crisis, you kind of get used to asking, uh, excuse me, for answering questions that people have about how your husband's doing, how you're doing, how are the kids doing, and you begin to have just sort of like canned answers. Because sometimes it's hard to find a word for the exhaustion, the number of undone tasks that you find around you. It's not something I've really experienced before. Also something that's new to me is just being weary of being the person that's the center of attention and it being not a positive thing. I sometimes feel like I'm the person with the problems and it makes me uncomfortable. Have you ever felt that way when you were going through something in your life that you just want to have good things to say? You don't want to be reporting problems to people? Well, I was feeling that way on this walk that morning and I was bemoaning to my friend how Christmas in our family and at church might have to be simpler this year and I was thinking that I might be letting people down by planning for a simpler Christmas. And I have a truth-telling friend and she gently interrupted me and said, you know, I know you've been really busy with what's going on with your family and so you may not have noticed some things but lots and lots of people are having a really rough year. I don't think you're really disappointing people in the church by making things simple. I think other people are also exhausted, Elizabeth. Oh, other people, right. Other people are also having a really hard time this year. Other people can't go see their family for Thanksgiving. Other people have lost loved ones. Other people have teenagers struggling with depression and mental health. Other people feel hopeless. Sometimes with good intentions, I still get overwhelmed by me. I stop noticing what's going on with others. What do you think about most of the time? I sometimes find I think about myself and I think about what other people think about myself. What do you notice when you first walk into a room? Do you notice the decorating, the food, the exit, because you want to be able to get away if you need to? All of us have a unique way that we take in our surroundings. Some might notice the power brokers in the room. Some might notice who looks fun. But you know who always notices the people that others don't see? Jesus. I want my friends to know that Jesus always sees people. So I want to start with Luke 13 this morning as we consider the way that Jesus sees people. I'm reading verses 10 to 17. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. 
She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. Then he touched her and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised God. But the leader in charge of the synagogue was indignant that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. There are six days of the week for working, he said to the crowd. Come on those days to be healed, not on the Sabbath. But the Lord replied, you hypocrites, each of you works on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from its stall on the Sabbath and lead it out to water? This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage by Satan for 18 years. Isn't it right that she be released, even on the Sabbath? This shamed his enemies, but all the people rejoiced at the wonderful things he did. When we come to this account in the book of Luke, Jesus is in the middle of his most intense time of ministry. It's in his third year. He's leading a delegation of Galilean pilgrims towards Jerusalem for worship. But there's mounting tension with Jewish and Roman authorities who are watching his every move and they're looking for a reason to arrest him. Right before this account, some of those Galilean pilgrims come to Jesus with some breaking news. It's their headline. He, they tell him that Pilate, the Roman governor, has executed Galilean pilgrims just like them who are worshiping in Jerusalem. I mean, that's some news that's going to strike close to home. They hope that Jesus is going to give them an answer about how he's about ready to deal with Rome, but he warns his followers that increased tension with Rome is coming. Jesus sees his own execution right on the horizon. And still, he stops. He stops on this day for worship in the synagogue. And when Jesus comes into a room, Jesus is looking for people. There's a Greek word in this passage that doesn't really show up very well in English. Jesus is talking about important stuff in the synagogue. It says he was teaching. And then there's an interjection. The interjection is look. Jesus can see that some people are drinking in his words and others have their arms crossed in defiance. And right there, there's this look. Luke wants us to see that right in the middle of teaching, Jesus' eyes are now fastened on this small woman in the back. Look, there's a woman in the back of the room. Nobody else noticed her because she's small and she's bent over double so she's hard to see. And she likes to fade into the background. She's hoping to listen and not be noticed. Jesus sees a woman, not a disease. This woman has been sick so long that people in her town thought of her by her deformity. She was crippled, bent over double with a curvature of the spine. And Luke lets us know that the physical symptom had a spiritual root. She couldn't stand up straight or walk normally or look anyone in the eye. She'd suffered for 18 years, pain, oppression, most likely all of her adult life. And at this point, people in the village would have seen her as her deformity. They had a shorthand label for her, the cripple, the sick lady. She was diminished to being thought of by her disability. This week is Thanksgiving. Many of us are going to interact with our families, either in real life or at least on Zoom. I'm wondering if you might be like me. You have someone in your life, maybe in your family, that's been difficult for so long that it's hard to separate them from the problems they create. You have a label for them. It's Uncle John who always drinks too much. It's Aunt Jenny who can never be serious. Aunt Jean, the flaming liberal, or the crazy right winger, or whatever. Sometimes it just becomes easier to think of people in kind of shorthand. Maybe it's because we don't wanna risk going deeper with them. We tell ourselves, don't expect much. Don't get disappointed. They are always like this. But consequently, we stop seeing people the way Jesus does. Jesus sees a woman, not spiritual bondage. Dr. Luke gives us his diagnosis 
the author of Luke is a doctor and he comments that she was crippled by an evil spirit that the physical symptoms she was experiencing had a spiritual root. We don't know what her story was. Perhaps she had a violent assault. Somehow this precious woman was hurt at a spiritual, emotional, and physical dimension. You can picture this kind of thing as a spiritual infection that took root in a wound. The Bible is never superstitious, but it is holistic. It talks about spiritual, emotional, and physical health, and they all matter to Jesus, and they're all inextricably tied together. Scientists used to scoff at a more holistic view, but recently modern medicine is catching up with Jesus' perspective. Listen to this quote from Dr. Erica Saunders. She is the chair of psychiatry at Penn State. She's talking about mind-body research, which is even more relevant given that roughly one in five women and lots of men, she's just talking about women, now suffer from mental illness and chronic conditions like heart disease are at the same time on the rise. The only way to get and keep people well is to treat the mind and body as two parts of a whole. Or as the Bible says, the body, soul, and spirit, all parts of what it means to be human. Jesus sees a woman, not spiritual bondage. Dr. Luke is giving a bit of a diagnosis here. Our author is a medical doctor, so he gives us more details. And he comments that she was crippled by an evil spirit, that the physical symptoms this woman was experiencing had a spiritual root. We don't know what her story was. Perhaps she'd experienced a violent assault that left her broken in body, soul, and spirit. Somehow this precious woman was hurt at a spiritual, emotional, and physical dimension. You can picture this as a kind of spiritual infection that took root in a wound and affected her whole person. The Bible is never superstitious, but it is holistic. Spiritual, emotional, and physical health all matter to God and matter to Jesus, and they are inextricably tied together. Scientists used to scoff at this more holistic view as being old-fashioned and religious, but recently modern medicine, with studies of the mind-body link, is catching up with Jesus' perspective. Dr. Erica Saunders from Penn State gives us this relevant quote. She's talking about women's health, but it applies to everyone. This kind of research is even more relevant, given that roughly one in five women now suffer from mental illness, and chronic conditions like heart disease are on the rise. The only way to get and keep people well is to treat the mind and body as two parts of a whole. The whole person. Bible calls it body, soul, and spirit that Jesus brings healing to. Jesus doesn't see parts, he sees people. Jesus sees a person and not an interruption. The synagogue leader here sees the woman as an unwanted intrusion to the agenda of worship and teaching and what should happen at the synagogue on Saturday. And Jesus sees this interruption as the main point of his visit. Contemplating this passage has me wondering, how often am I so committed to my agenda, a church agenda, maybe I see it as a God agenda, that I fail to see what God is up to in interruptions from my neighbors, my kids, all kinds of interruptions in my day? Am I watching like Jesus for what the main point might be in my interruptions? My husband, even in his current limitations where he's working less, has always been more flexible than I am. He's a good listener and he gives people space to share. This week, Rick was just starting to spend office hours again and he had a routine meeting. And in that meeting, he found out a person that we see regularly was hurting. I might have just accomplished the agenda of the meeting and not noticed, moved on to the next, next task, missed the person in front of me. Making space to listen in the interruptions allows you to see the stories that are happening all around you. Jesus sees people, not interruptions. Jesus addresses the woman, not his opponents.
Now in this situation, Jesus has people that are waiting for him to make a mistake. He has a synagogue ruler who's carefully watching everything he does. And if you give me a room full of people that are supporting me and loving me and a couple critics, I'm going to focus on the critics, unfortunately. Did you know that there's a word for this? It's negativity bias. It's a word for the fact that as humans, we're kind of wired to focus on the negative because we look for threats to our well-being. So it, it, I find it fascinating that Jesus in this case does not focus on his critics. He doesn't focus on his opponents. He is zeroed in on this woman who matters to God. He also doesn't start by addressing his critics or by building a case for why he should be able to heal on the Sabbath. He starts by addressing the need of a daughter. He walks across the room to talk directly to her and he focuses on her and addresses her first. He addresses the woman and not the demon. Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. In other exorcisms, Jesus addressed the demon directly, but here he addresses the woman. I notice that he honors who she is as a person, not a problem. She's been dehumanized by her deformity for 18 years. Even on this day, Others see her as this unwanted interruption, but Jesus sees her. He could address her from the front of the room, but he's come close. And he doesn't address the demon as he, as he does at other times. His cure for her is very personal. He addresses her with respect and love, dear woman. And he sets her free from her past. You are healed. In this passage, you are healed literally means you are loosed. And it's an unusual word that you don't find throughout Jesus's healings in the New Testament. It's particularly for her. Jesus is emphasizing the fact that this woman is separate, not defined by her deformity or her oppression. He makes a clear and decisive pronouncement that she's set free. She's separate from her past hurt, her present shame. She's set free to a good future. Can you imagine what it would feel like to be suddenly set free from a painful twisted back and at the same time the weight of your past in one powerful moment? No wonder Luke tells us how she praised God. Jesus saw her and set her free. Jesus honors the person that God created. First of all, he insists that the Sabbath is for setting people free. I love Jesus' urgency here. It would have been easy for Jesus to send her a little message and tell her to come back tomorrow, and then she wouldn't rock the boat. And it seems like a practical choice. It's an easy choice to make when you are not the person suffering. But Jesus refuses to have this woman wait one more day. Jesus is also tuned in to the Old Testament truth about Sabbath. Deuteronomy tells us that stopping work on the Sabbath was meant to remind Israel that they're no longer slaves. Sabbath keeps people from dehumanizing bondage. It's a day for remembering our humanity and for setting people free. I've had a hard time taking rest lately. From the point that Rick had his stroke, it seemed like there's been more work to do than time in the day. And I've adjusted, I've made it happen. You probably do the same thing in your life. I've tried to take days off, but I've faced lots of interruptions and little crises. It even happened when we tried to take a bit of vacation. Between a business, the church, and supervising distance learning, you get the picture and many of you are dealing with many of the same circumstances. But here's the part that I don't like to face. For my whole life, there's always been a reason for me not to take rest. There was too much homework when I was a student. There are interruptions from my business, shipping problems, product problems. When I had little kids, I couldn't ever stop with the things that were going on with my little kids. And there are people issues that come from church. This person needs me, etc. But I read this quote this week in my homework for emotionally healthy spirituality that stopped me in my tracks. Sabbath requires surrender. If we only stop when we are finished with all our work, we will never stop because our work is never completely done. 
With every accomplishment arises a new responsibility. Sabbath dissolves the artificial urgency of our days because it liberates us from the need to be finished. On the Sabbath, Jesus saw this woman's humanity and set her free. Now I wanna to speak to my people for a moment. These are the too busy people. Those of you who don't struggle with this issue, could you please restfully pray for us while I talk to them? Sabbath is the day that we set aside for rest and to listen to God. And some things will only get set right in your life and in my life on, on the Sabbath when we rest. Maybe today is that day for you. Today, Jesus sees your humanity. Maybe you've joked that you will rest when you die. You are not just an employee or a boss or a business owner that brings value to your workplace. You are not just a mom or a dad that keeps things working for your family. Or maybe you're keeping things working for your adult children and grandchildren. You are created in the image of God. You don't have to earn a break by finishing all the work in front of you. It will never be done. You get a break because you are a loved child of God. You get a break because you're not a slave and you're also not God. The universe will continue to function without you. I'm talking to you, Elizabeth Sachek. Jesus sees you on this Sabbath day and he wants to set you free to rest, just like the woman in the story. Jesus chose to touch her. Commentators point out that no other exorcism story includes this detail that Jesus reached out to touch her. I believe that Jesus reached out to, because she was bent over double and he wanted to raise her up to standing. Jesus chose to look her in the eye, not to speak down to her, or he could have proclaimed a healing from across the room. He proclaimed a healings from across town in other situations. But every action of Jesus honored the personhood of the woman in front of him. Earlier this week, we got a call from Lydia Sanders, who is the tireless advocate who runs the Family and Community Resource Center for the Battleground School District. We love her and we love to partner with what she does. And she had a situation with a family with a sick single mom with no hot water. Unfortunately, when she helped them get a plumber, he pointed out he couldn't fix the water without fixing the rotten floor. And the rotten floor could probably not be, finished, uh, could not be fixed without addressing the black mold problem. The problems with their mobile home went on and on. And it was at this point that Lydia thought to herself, that she should call BG4, and she contacted my tireless friend, Karen Phillips. Now, why would Lydia call the church when she has a construction problem? What can the church do to address so many needs? I actually asked her that. What she said is more than a new water heater, more than a new floor, more than new walls, this family needs to be surrounded right now by loving, honoring relationships that will help them find resources and find their way forward. Wow, I learned something from Lydia this week. Karen's already gathering resources, some from our church, some from our community to offer options for this woman and her housing issues to care for her family. If you want to be a part of that, you can talk to me or email Karen at bg4.com. She's doing it in the context, though, of an honoring and loving relationship. In this year, it's easy for me to be overwhelmed by human need and almost want to put my fingers in my ears because it's too much and stop noticing. I cannot meet all the needs around me. We don't have enough resources. But you know what each one of us can do? We can see people, we can honor them by stopping and noticing and taking time to listen. We can give what we have and maybe in the space that's created when we're looking people in the eye, when we're listening to them, maybe in that space we give the opportunity for Jesus to do a miracle and meet their needs. Jesus speaks to the person that God created. He sees who God intended her to be. God made this woman to walk straight and be able to look people in the eye. God intended her to be free from shame and suffering, mental, emotional, and physical.
She's been trapped in the pain of her past. It affected her body, her mind, her emotions for too long. And still, Jesus sees her. Have you ever felt trapped in your past and mistakes, bent over by shame? A friend of mine in one of our groups recently made the brilliant connection that shame stops us from looking up and addressing our problems. We bend over, we ignore, we avoid, and we can't move on. Shame condemns you and I to isolation, but Jesus gently lifts each one of us up to look him in the eyes and receive grace and healing. If you're willing, I would love for you to take a moment to close your eyes this morning and imagine yourself in that synagogue in the very back row, pushed up against the wall, hoping no one will notice you. You're watching and listening to Jesus. But now Jesus' eyes look straight at you and he's coming your way. What does it feel like to be seen by Jesus? And what might he want to untie from you this week? Are you bent over? Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's a hurt or offense from the last months when there's been continual arguing and tension with friends and family. Are you suffering with physical illness that's sucking the life out of you? Are you carrying the weight of the world, convinced you can't take a break or everything will fall apart? Jesus wants to untie your burden this morning. Perhaps you are going to be going to see family this week and it's, it's easy to fall back into the old family roles. You have labels for other people and they have labels for you. But what would it look like to remember that Jesus sees people, their stories beyond their labels. He even sees people in your family. What would happen if you asked Jesus to help for his help to see your old family with his new vision? Jesus type vision. I love that people in our community call BG4 when they know someone who needs to be seen, who needs to be loved. I want to be a church that's known for seeing people, not a church that sees problems to be solved or agendas to be accomplished, but a church that sees people like Jesus sees people. I want my friends to know Jesus sees people. My prayer for us this morning is that we would see with Jesus' eyes and we'd reach out to be his hands and feet. Lord, would you do that in us this week at our thanksgivings, in our interactions with people at work, in our interactions with you where we recognize that you see us. Help us also to see others with your eyes and to love the way you love and reach out to be your hands and feet. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.